Hey everybody. Yeah, it's been a long time. Sorry, things have gotten hectic. It's nice to get back to it. Hopefully tonight isn't a complete disaster, but maybe that's worth watching too. What's up, Alex? Hey, it's Steve. All right, I'm not gonna get started talking about what I'm gonna do tonight for another couple minutes while everybody rolls in. Thanks for coming out, you guys. I appreciate it. It's awesome. The audio works, right? You guys can hear me just fine. I can see the bar moving, but I just want to make sure. All right, so I kind of came up with a scheme that I'm going to do for the three nights of Lightbox. I hope you guys are having <laughs> um, a cool Lightbox. If you guys have hope and really be able to take advantage of going and seeing the booths and listening to the talks. Um, I haven't been able to jump in yet. Sounds like it's going pretty well. People are getting pretty excited about some of these talks. So what I'm going to do is, and I don't know if anybody had a chance to grab this file or anybody cares, um, I'm going to use this file, this base silhouette, um, for all three nights. But I'm going to do a different character each night based on the silhouette. And I'm going to leave it up to you guys which one you want me to start with. Whether we're going to do, um, hey, uh, if we're going to do a, we can do a mech tonight. Those tend to take the longest, so I might run a little overtime. Uh, we'll do like a like a demon. Those are always really fun. And then we can do like an alien, something a little bit more science fiction or something like that. Uh, so I'll leave it up to the um, sort of the group to choose. But basically, I'm just gonna like again, like I'm just gonna drop this silhouette down. Yeah, uh, the file is on Gumroad. Uh, you'll just see it. It's just downloadable. It's for free. So you can grab the exact same file that I'm working on now. And if you ever want to try it out and just draw on top of it, you can just go grab it. Uh, well, I want to do a retro Space Ranger, but it's a mech. An alien. What was the other one I said? Or a uh, demon. If I feel like doing a Space Ranger tomorrow night or something like that. But I those right now, those are the ones that I've just kind of like mentally started getting my head around. So, any thoughts? Oh yeah, I'll post this up. As soon as it's done, I'll, I'll post it up so anybody wants to, wants to watch it if they can. Alien, uh, alien, demons, but yes, do all, yeah, we'll do them all. <laughs> well, we're gonna do them all. <laughs> okay, I'll just, I'll start getting kind of set up. Argue at me, and then yeah. Anybody who can't make it to any of these other ones, it's no problem. Because um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna. As soon as this is done, if there's anything I'm bizarre, I'll edit it out. But really, I usually just hit publish, and it just goes, and it's in in the feed of my uh, YouTube channel, and you guys can watch it whenever you want. And if it's catastrophic, you can always just come back and laugh and laugh and laugh. Demon, we got a demon. I think someone else said demon. Okay, we'll start with demon tonight. Demon's always fun. Let's see if I'm shaky tonight. Shaky is hidden by by demons. So if your hands are shaky, always draw something organic. <laughs> All right, so let's make sure that I have everything set properly. All right, so I'm just gonna start playing with some shapes, see what I wanna do. And I will look up at the chat as often as I can. Um, and if you guys have any questions or if you just wanna make fun of me, by all means. So the reason I thought that this would be kind of fun, this, this idea is one of the things that comes up 
when you're uh, designing for especially like video games, but it happens in, in film as well, is um, as a way of kind of being economical, um, they'll have skins on characters um, so that they can still use the same animations and same rigs and um, and that way uh, all you're really doing is adding a new mesh to it and so a, a lot of times there's a, a, a very big need for designing on the same silhouette so that they can use the same rig but they want it to be as different as possible so it's a really fun challenge um, way to kind of like test what the limitations are so I think I'm going to do some like atypical mouth shapes here maybe the tongue is kind of becomes the arm But yeah, I've worked on numerous video games where like some of the most fun, it's always at the end of the production where they want to just add like a bunch of armors or skins to kind of like flesh out the game and make it a little bit more, um, just like more, more value, more interesting stuff, you know, running around the, running around the game, playing as different characters, even though it's really just the same character. So this is, this is just like a really useful, and kind of like fun project in production. I haven't had to do the skins lately, but I am um, probably going to do some in the next few weeks because you know there's always, um, they, like a lot of games will have like um, body types for crowds, and so then but then they want the crowds to feel really fleshed out so you do three or four different body types and then um, you know so you do like a tall and slender and kind of like wide and girthy and you know like whatever else you can think of and then you just sit there with that same sort of general joint layout skeleton and figure out um, what works best for um, making it feel more like there's more characters actually going on even though they're really just running a few rigs and just running instances of them, which can be really efficient. Not quite sure what I'm gonna do with this face yet. Mouth, shoulders, you know, typical stuff. And then do some, instead of doing like standard hands, we'll do like more sinewy claw type hands. The nice thing about demons is like, you know, you can really play off of, you know, sharp shapes like bones and skeletal systems and just really, I don't know, it's a really fun shape logic. It's a lot different than, I mean, you can make an alien out of it, but I think with aliens, you always want to at least show off like some of their tech. That's what I'm talking about, like a, like, you know, like an advanced alien or something like that. So it's always nice to do a demon where it's just real fleshy. Let's do some cool knee pad things.
and at any given time my dog might come stomping in here and disrupt everything so just if that happens it's it's predictable it's probably going to happen because he's not very old so he doesn't really know the rules yet I want to just keep adding details, but I want to make sure that I can actually get this done in front of you guys tonight. Hey, Dad. Do I already have an idea? No, I'm just working this out. I didn't. I, I, I started to do that. I started to think about like what ideas I could do, but I, I wanted to make sure that I was just kind of like thinking on the fly. Uh, let's see where am I? Oh yeah, my puppy, he's uh, he's almost full grown, he's um, about 120 pounds now. He's a Great Dane, if anybody doesn't know that I do the Great Dane thing. And he's beautiful, but he's still a puppy, so he's still, he goes from sweet to mischievous very fast. dismembered head or something. Yeah, that'll work. All right, we'll probably add some more details. I think I'm gonna do some like veins and stuff like that on this guy, but this will get us started. All right, so I'm gonna drop everything down. I'll start inking. You want to see the puppy? No, he might come in. There's not really a good way to stop him. I always like doing skins for games as well because they didn't very very um, rarely did they even care if they made sense in the project as far as like in games so like if you had like downloadable skins it was just kind of like we just need cool stuff and I was like that was your assignment and so you would just do all kinds of random things oh I can hear him smashing at the door oh here he is hey come here Come here, come say hi to everybody. Say hi. You guys see him? Hello. No, he's not very much. All right. take very long. I thought I had more time before it came smashing in. Yeah, this is, um, uh, uh, we've always gotten Great Danes. That's been kind of our dog of choice. They're always really fun and fun to play with. His, his ball that he plays with outside is a basketball. <laughs> you can imagine. That's the one he can fit in his mouth. I should probably put some pictures up of them on Instagram or something like that. So people, we named them Bear after my studio, which is to my kids and chagrin or whatever you want to say, but whatever. I get to name them. Do 
Do I use any sleuthing on my strokes? This one? Yeah, it looks like this. Wait, is that on? Yeah, sometimes. I guess that's on. Stabilization. Yep. Not by not by choice. I didn't mean to, but um, I definitely use it for um, when I'm doing um, really clean technology. And some sometimes I can just hit nice clean strokes without any stabilization going on. But if I'm hitting big arcs and stuff like that, it's nice to have a little help. No reason to really fight that stuff. Make that a little bit more rib cagey. It's starting to fade. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I uh, sorry to do these late at night, but I don't get off work until pretty late, so it's the best I can do. What subjects from nature have inspired my... I'm big into crabs right now. Love me some crabs. Crabs and deep sea kind of crustaceans. And then I like... I know this sounds obvious when I say this, but I like, I'm really liking dogs. Um, I think quadrupeds have always been really tricky to make look natural. You know, designing one is one thing, but making it, you know, feel um, natural the way the body kind of like slinks around and stuff like that. So I've always, I've been looking a lot at my dog and other dogs and, you know, greyhounds and just how elegant they are. But yeah, right now those are my go-tos is I really like crabs. And then I don't know what it'll be next. I like looking at moose a lot. They're like aliens to me, but I've not really ever been able to like utilize that too much. since six in the morning Blah. no way what's the great question what animal you might have to hit you might have to hit the questions a couple of times if I don't because the feed goes past and I don't catch them all the time and if I go quiet that means I'm Struggling with a line. <laughs> All right, there we go. Sorry. Can you talk a little bit of how you make decisions and shape designs? I'm working on deepening my understanding of shape language and would love to know how you think about this. Um, sure, yeah, we can talk about shape. Um, I think pretty much every shape, uh, well, let me preface it with, um, what I'm gonna say sounds a little bit like a rule and um, my, my feeling on rules is as soon as you know how they work, it's fine to break them. Um, but it's, it's always good to uh, get good at how the actual rules work. And they're your own rules, you know, they're not necessarily, I mean, there are rules in art, but um, once you understand general premises, then it's totally fine to break them. Don't ever think like, once you learn a rule, that's like, you have to do it like that forever. Um, but I, I tend to draw on rule of thirds meaning like every shape that I draw is a thick to thin, it's balanced as far as like how much detail. If there's a, a lot of detail, then I wanna make sure that there's a rest space. So um, 
you know, for instance, like if I was doing this character, I would make sure that, you know, like I'm clustering these teeth and then I'm having this big shoulder pad here that's going to be relatively simple. And you can see how like, that's kind of like a rest moment where there's like kind of like something simple to look at and then it's like, it gets really clustered and detailed and then the chest will be a nice relief. Um, I think it's really important to give the viewer time to kind of parse things. When there's the same level of detail all over everything, then it becomes problematic. And that's the same thing with shapes, you know, like the shapes have to flow um, from small to big. And I, you know, obviously like I draw a lot more stylized than some people. Um, so I'm exaggerating that form, but it's it's kind of the rhythms that you always see in like nature books and stuff like that. Like those are those, you know, like what we all kind of like uh, all together kind of like find beautiful. The, the reason is those rhythms work, you know, like I, I even though like I'm drawing this like terrible monster, I'm trying to make it appealing in the same way in some way. So If everything starts to feel like it's the same size, if you split something right down the middle in any way, um, then it starts to feel a little unnatural. And I think that that is something that can always be worked on. But the way that you cluster details, you know, make sure that there's always a little bit of play, a little rest whenever there's a ton of details. And I just, I just kind of am always looking for that. As soon as I started getting into the weeds of details, then I always try and balance that with something calmer. And I find that that works for me. you start your designs with line work or do you sometimes block them in before putting down your lines? I were, I start with line work. Um, I, I just am sort of trained myself that way. That's, but it's not like a, I'm actually been thinking a lot about that. Um, one thing that I'll do and you'll, you'll see me do this is like when I start adding secondary and tertiary details on this thing, um, I'll start doing, I start like, um, it won't, it won't be long until I start putting some details in, but like when I do like a, a hose or a vein, I'll just put it on a separate layer and draw like some solids in and then draw, and go back and do the line work over those because it's, sometimes it's easier for me um, to, to hit certain shapes like that. But I don't, I, I'm just kind of like a, a line nut, you know, the artists that I, I love are all line people and I don't know, it's just a personal preference but a lot of the Disney guys and you know a lot of a lot of the new designers are all doing this like really beautiful like blocking of shapes and uh, it's just amazing it's so stunning so I, I have been thinking about how to kind of incorporate some of that but the thick to thin line weight you know I just I just find it so appealing and fun to do so I it's kind of like you know one of my bad habits, I guess. And then you're seeing me do this thing that I've been doing a lot lately and, and it's a bad habit and I don't really want to like propagate it, but um, I start dropping in shadows and it helps me kind of parse forms as far as like you know the distance things are from each other but it um, I do it as I go because I'm comfortable doing it but it is <laughs> it can get you into a lot of trouble so take it for what it really is it's a, it's a bad habit kind of like establishes like how we're gonna do the other shoulder so we can walk over there and do that one. I 
I'm I, I'm not gonna tell you Tad I'm not gonna tell anybody that what I'm doing is a good or a bad thing all I'm saying is like it's committal right like when you were like establishing a drawing it's committal like you start committing to anything too early and it, uh, it takes away your flexibility so if I'm dropping in a shadow like I'm doing right now like I'm literally doing right now then I've just committed to a lot of things and you know if I want to make an edit to that it's just a bigger deal that's all I'm saying like it's not a, it's it's not a big deal it's just one of those things where it's like just you just have to be aware of what you're doing to yourself if you're a little bit masochistic and willing to take your lumps if you make a mistake it's great Like I said, I just I I I've, I've kind of like started doing it in my own work mainly because it helps me. Like you can see, like I can tell like how f those teeth are floating above the the flesh of the upper arm, and that just sort of helps me keep track of things as I'm detailing things out. Thinking of color at the time you live in, you're dividing up your figure. Sometimes you have trouble with color overlapping, with colors overlapping. Yeah, I, I start thinking about color. Like I have an idea of what I, I would do with this guy already. Um, it's it's not something that I um, that I lock myself into because I love when I get to the color stage. A big part of my process when I, or the process that I talk about. Um, online when I'm doing this is is a very editable very kind of like uh, kind of find your way there process um, so I don't know if we're gonna have time to color it um, if you guys just want to stick around maybe I can throw some color on it um, but for an hour's demo we'll probably only get the design placed but um, but yeah, I think about the color and the rhythms, you know, like I, I think the, you know, like this belly would be like kind of more of like a flesh color or whatever the flesh of this character would be. And then, um, and then I start thinking about like where the carapace is, you know, like you can imagine like almost like this guy's like venom where like the flesh of the arm is one color and then the carapace is another color. So I am thinking about like the color breakdown of that. advice for high schoolers interested in animation I have I mean you're probably getting earfuls of, of, of advice right being in high school it's like everyone's got something to tell you I'll tell you things but you know you take them you take them at your own risk and you put the value into them that you want um, I know this isn't the answer you're gonna want to hear though so I'm just gonna go ahead and say that too you have to start drawing from life. You have to. You have to get into gesture drawings. You have to draw just from life, learn how the real world works. And um, obviously you have to study, you know, like what everyone else is doing in animation. But you have, if you want to draw, even if you, you know, even our, um, when all the digital uh, animators that I've worked with are amazing life drawers just can capture gestures they have this whole like what happens with life drawing is like it's super boring at first um, but then what happens is you start building up like this sort of like repository of posing the way things move the way hands are posed same thing as a character designer you have all these kind of takeaways from your sessions of just like how something moved and how it intrigued you and you start incorporating that stuff into your work and things just feel more natural because of that so I find that it's paramount that you're just always live drawing and you don't have to be good at it. You do not have to be a good 
life drawer. That is not the point. The point is you're basically in class taking notes. That's life drawing. If you think it's there to like make beautiful drawings, then you're missing the point. The point is to take notes. Um, and those notes are for you. So don't worry about showing anybody else. Don't worry about if they're good, if everybody else is doing like fine art next to you and they're just gorgeous and whatever else. It doesn't matter. The point is like you're just trying to take notes. You're like, oh, look at the way that hand is and you're making notes of how that hand it works. Um, do a lot of that. And then a lot of people, you know, especially when you're in high school, it's tricky to kind of find places to do life drawing. So I always suggest just drawing things like plants um, just but just you just have to limit your time right like you say like I'm gonna draw this plant this tree whatever and I'm gonna give myself I don't know five minutes a minute whatever and you just see if you can get the gesture of it because the way that nature grows is like slow motion gesture drawings so if you can get in there and um, practice those poses of how like a branch moved out from a tree or how it's leaning from being windswept its whole life but you only give yourself five minutes it might as well be a gesture drawing it's better than nothing obviously it won't teach you how to draw a hand but it'll teach you how to draw natural forms and then the fun part about if you're in high school and you're learning animation just watch as much animation as possible and just like really pay attention to just like when something just feels so fluid I grew up in the VHS era, which I'm, if you're in high school, I'm not even sure you know what I'm talking about. Um, but, you know, like I would burn out my Aladdin VHS tape. Just I would just put it on slow motion and just watch it. And it would take six hours to get through and just watch it frame by frame by frame. And I loved it. It was so much fun. And I would just do whatever I was doing that day. And I would just like walk by and see like an in-between frame and just learn just like how things worked. But like you know like how flesh works like you know like a lot of the stuff that I use in my designs like this guy here like I know that stuff from life drawing like I and that's like a, not like that I'm like a drawing flesh <laughs> you know dead things or stuff like that but like the forms and the way that this stuff all works is all drawn from nature from observation and that's actually the fastest way to find your style if you want to, if if you're the type of person who's really looking for a style, and it's not that you're trying to draw like someone else, which is fine, but if you really want to establish your own style, drawing from life is the fastest way there. Because, like I said, you're taking notes, and so it's your shorthand, and that's really all style is: is shorthand. Shorthand is shorthanding your observations. And you watch any animation, you wonder like why they made those decisions. It's like that's how they draw ears fast. You know, that's how they observe the necessary lines to represent an ear. That's all style really is. And some people have really cool ways of doing it. And that becomes kind of like their language. And that's how you'll develop your own style. All right, I'm going to look up at the chat. All right, there's no questions specifically on there right now, but... If there's any questions, don't let me get too far without trying to address them. Do you usually work with one consistent light source? Uh, no, that's actually something I'm really interested in. I try and mix it up as much as possible. Backlight, side light, multiple lights. Multiple lights are tricky. Like you really have to mentally commit to that. That's like doing a Sudoku puzzle in extreme mode. Um, but you have to, you know, if you want to do it, it's great. It's super fun. But um, when I'm quick sketching, yeah, I'll pick a light source. You know, top three quarters, something like that. Um, something basic. Um, something that I can you know mentally kind of get my head around because you know you're doing multiple equations at the same time you're doing light you're doing form you're doing you know perspective character last thing you need to do is go bogging yourself down with just tons and tons of other equations that you have to figure out but that said you know i i, I love 
messing with different light sources, kick lights. Um, you know, I, I I grew up in the in the video game industry where we were always playing around with like CG models and rendering them, and I modeled a lot of stuff. And it's one of those things where you like, you see something rendered with like crazy lights, and you're just like, I need to do that in my in my work, and you just get really inspired by it. So, yeah, I love multiple light sources. It's just it's one of those things. Like I said, you got to kind of commit to it. I think that is a gets a little bit more towards like a like a personal piece. There's not really a good reason to do multiple light sources for a production piece. You might just actually be kicking yourself and kicking the team uh, by doing that. Um, because a simple light source is really all production needs in order to kind of get something modeled or, you know, um, into, pro into production. You start multi putting multiple light sources in and they're like, what what is the actual color of this thing? You know, you, you start really messing with your actual team. Did I make that hand way too low? All right, we're going to move it up. I'll draw it first, then we'll move it up. Have you ever felt like you don't like your own style and wish you were a different game? <laughs> okay. Shane? I, I, this is a little bit of my soapbox, so I, I apologize for this. But, uh, and, and a lot of people have heard me rant about this before, but it is like, kind of like my go-to, like, uh, old man talk, because like, I'm getting to be an old man, so now, like, you know, you have your thing that you just rant and rave about. So, bear with me here. Everyone hates their own work. I hate my own work like there are days where I'm like ah oh, I did better than usual but I always always wish that my work looked like the stuff that I'm falling in love with every day and now that Instagram and Facebook and ArtStation and all that stuff exist it's like a constant reminder of just how much you wish you could just draw like someone else but you have to really think about that everyone else wishes they could draw like you and the asset that you have going for you is the fact that you are bringing yourself to the table. You are bringing your experiences, your style, your way of interpreting the world that no one else can do. And so while you'll never ever, and I've met people in their 80s who are never happy with their work and never have been happy with their work, even though like it's just drool worthy and all you can do is wish that you had the chops that these guys and ladies had. But uh, the fact is, you make peace with it. You make peace with the fact that um, it doesn't matter if you like your work. It's the experience of making this stuff. And then the admiration and the people loving your work remind you that no matter how much you dislike your work, it's working. It's, it's, it's happening and people are, are responding to it. And so you just you just got to keep making it the way you make it. And instead of getting upset that other people are drawing the way you wish you could draw, you just enjoy their work and just go on the journeys with them. So it's frustrating. It's a really uh, tough way to kind of live is the fact that you're, you're never actually going to be very happy with your, your work. But it's also once you make peace with it, it's kind of awesome because then you stop caring you just do your best and everything will come. All right, I'm gonna move this hand up. Kinda like it low like that, but I think it's a little low. Yeah, I've actually, and I'm actually much more comfortable saying that than I used to be. Um, I used to have a lot more anxiety about that, and I wasn't sure if I was actually right, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but I've been fortunate to meet some of my idols, art idols, and talk with them, and to find out that people that I just think are like, let's say the cat's pajamas, um, also are going through the same anxieties and frustrations 
it's just it's just proof that like it's okay it's okay they you see that they've made peace with it and you see that they're still making the work that you are glad that they're creating and then you get there yourself and you just kind of relax and instead of worrying about what something looks like and if it's a good style and if it's a good piece you're just drawing for fun and you just draw the way you draw and you let other people like it <laughs> or don't like it they'll let you know one way or another Be able to at least tone this thing. I don't want to keep you guys from the other demos. They said there's a lot of really cool ones going on. clients it's easy to think let's see how long does it take you for you to complete a single design um, all right that's from David Liu so let me let me get a bit of clarification are you talking about for my own pieces like my own work or are you talking about for professional work difference can I have an answer for both sure let's do both for my personal work um, especially lately but most of my life I've always spent um, between an hour and three hours on a piece and there are pieces that exist in my portfolio that I've taken uh, quite a bit longer um, but on average uh, what I like to do for my own pieces um, is, is sort of like I feel sort of satiated and, and, enjoy, and I'm enjoying the piece if I'm keeping it to about an hour that's sort of like my go-to favorite thing uh, hour and a half two hours it's fine it's like still within the same realm um, and that is really a personal choice. It's just like, I, I don't know, it's, I'm doing it for fun and I, I just enjoy making the piece and that's the amount of time that I want to make a piece for, you know, like that, that I sit and have fun and kind of explore things. And then sometimes things work out and I want to explore it further. And so it's not like a hard set rule or by any means, I don't, and I just don't live by hard set rules in that way. But when it comes to client work, it takes much, much longer. Um, and I think it is a little bit of a psychological thing. It's, um, I, I think you, you're, you're always, you're trying to think through the lens of another person, right? And so very, very rarely does a client contact you and just say, just draw whatever you want. <laughs> and the, there's no brief, there's no like problem to solve. You know, when I'm solving a problem like drawing a demon tonight, like I'm just going to solve it the way I think is the coolest way to solve it. Um, but when I have to draw for a client, they're they're giving me a challenge to solve something that, you know, like may not have been on my mind. You know, it may not have been the crab or the moose that I was interested in on Pinterest. Um, so I may not feel the same motivation or the same interest. And so you have to kind of do the research. You have to kind of get yourself mentally prepared to do the best and then explore it multiple ways and I do a lot a lot of loose sketches a lot of loose sketches that nobody ever sees trying to come up with ideas uh, before I commit to anything for the client so they take a, just a considerable more time I think the average client piece takes probably about six hours for uh, like a rough design I do three to four as initial designs, I'll do multiple passes on it, color passes, rendering passes, and then final poses. Um, there can be, you know, 
40 hours, 80 hours into a character, no problem. Uh, Cecilia, the question, that time frame is just for the design stage, not for full rendering, yes. Uh, I, I'm faster at rendering than I used to be, but no, I think full renders, like some of the stuff you'd seen in some of my other stuff, it's usually, like a, um, if I was jumping to color and render with this thing, I'd probably need another hour or two. So those are more like three hour pieces. Um, but, and I, and I, I, if you guys are interested, I have a process that I've been showing on my YouTube channel and you'll see it in some of my pieces on the YouTube channel. Um, that is very quick and efficient and has a lot of tricks that kind of make things quick. So doing it in a couple hours is not like the end of the world, but if I'm doing something for myself or like, a, like we were talking about before, we're exploring multiple light sources or um, different kinds of lighting or different materials, surface materials that are really kind of like new and interesting to me. Uh, if you want to get into like glass and reflections, things that are maybe not as in, as necessary for a production piece, uh, just to get it modeled, um, then they can take a lot longer, no problem. And the, and the clients, they're gonna pay you to just do it until you're you're done. So like, you know, it's not, it doesn't matter if it takes three hours or it takes eight hours or whatever, that's what they're looking for. I don't know if that makes any sense. Okay, so here's what I was talking about before, where I said like, I'll, I'll kind of like lay down this um, line work and then like I want to add some sort of like veins. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just pick a, kind of like a light color, pick a solid brush and I'm just going to put some veins. I like I like doing this as far as like just kind of keeps my brain from freaking out because I can do it in like a separate pass. top of that I'm going to go back in and start inking again so now I can just sort of like follow these forms and not worry about the stuff underneath I'll, be, I'll go back to the questions in a second. And then once that's kind of in, once those are kind of in, and I can just make a selection. Did I? Of course I drew on this wrong layer. All right, we got a different different process. I drew on the wrong layer. You guys ever done that? I'm sure everyone has. All right, so to get rid of that, I'm going to. So the way, uh, what I just did was I loaded it as a selection and then I went down to my line work went layer and I deleted everything that was underneath it. Go back to this and then I'm gonna get rid of that pink. that to opacity which is something that's cool in clip studio and now it's transparent again and then I can merge that back down into the underlying layer and start 
kind of working those forms together. But that's, uh, you know, like when I'm working on like robots and stuff like that, I get, when I'm adding in like additional hoses and stuff like that, I really like to use that. Because then I'm able to just sort of draw things and have them flow a little bit better. And I just go back and kind of integrate them. and my silhouette turned off and you can just do like load a selection um, but I'm going to just fill it by hand because with all these like nooks and crannies and kind of like my soft line work it just becomes problematic but I'm gonna make sure I'm on the right layer okay so it doesn't matter what color this is, this is just for the fill layer, and this will just take me 10 minutes. So just ask questions, I'll keep looking up. How do you know what kind of details to add to a mech after roughing everything out? Is it just instinctive at this point? Uh, yeah, it's starting to become instinctive. Um, I've always been really interested in it, but like I, like I like looking at really functional mechanical stuff a lot. Like I, I like I like working on cars and things like that. But besides that, I like really just um, paying attention to like really functional movable stuff like how joints work you know, like um, on different things one of the one really good one if you're interested in like a quick and dirty one is always look at the landing gear on like fighter jets and 747s they're very articulated in there almost like transformers so those are like that's a really good resource um, old machinery tends to be a lot more like on the functional level so they, it tends to move a lot more and I, I, I just like really like paying attention to those joints and then of course um, skeletons and actual like nature just taking what's going on in nature and um, turning it into mech is totally a good idea as well so you can do that as well but yeah you, um, the the rule that I use for drawing like a mech, and I think I'll probably do the mech tomorrow night because I'll be a little bit more warmed up, um, is I try to draw things that are functional. So, you know, like your, the shoulder is always some sort of like crazy ball socket. And, you know, like as I explore different ball sockets, they be, they're sort of like these little pet projects of like, how can I do a different ball socket? When I was working on the Ratchet and Clank stuff, like it was always like a big sphere and we just kind of get bored of that. So there was always this like desire to um, find other ways of doing shoulders just so there was like an added interest I think maybe that's where that kind of fascination of different kind of like mechanisms stems from autosave okay but yeah I think robots in particular are one of those things where you just kind of have to be fascinated by really random stuff. If I, if you guys haven't already, start a Pinterest page. It's normally made for like wedding planning and things like that, but it works awesome for doing like reference and finding just masses and masses of really cool tech poses. I have like anatomy pages, I have m monster pages, creatures, uh, not creatures, uh, um, like animals like that I think are really fascinating, and just thousands of pins, but, and then like you're curating your own interests, and you go back and look at it, and you're like, it just, it's funny, you go back and it's just like aesthetically pleases you, because like it's all the things you love, all in one place, like a big bulletin board of just things that you think are great, it's really satisfying, I spend at least half an hour a day just either looking at my Pinterest page or just adding things to my Pinterest page. I've been doing that for over a decade. I'm sorry it's taking more time than I wanted it to, but like I said, if I had just like done a wand fill, I would have had all kinds of like crappy edges because it's just it's not super clean art uh, line work. I wouldn't be able to trap it very well.
Um, but one thing that I think I've said in some of my other streams is like with one nice thing about flatting by hand right after you've drawn something is you still have some muscle memory of the forms. So you tend to be able to flat things really fast. And I've noticed that if I have to come back and flat something that I drew a few days before, or anyway, a certain amount of time has lapsed between it, I can't flat it nearly as fast. So that's something to keep in mind. Like even if like you're not going to be able to render it the same night, I'll often like push myself to at least get the flats in, even though just kind of get the busy work done because I'm just faster and more accurate with it. And then I'll come back and actually do the actual rendering and painting in another session if that's the if that's what's got to happen. And actually have taken to um, often doing my pieces in two sessions so where I'll draw and then I'll do the flatting or something like that and I'll get it to a point and then I'll take a step away and I'll work on it the next day and come in with the fresh eyes and obviously leads to me correcting a lot of really stupid mistakes or things that I think could be better. Can you share educational stuff that had a big impact on you, like books, teachers, that we can find online? Uh, let's see, educational stuff that had a big impact on me. Um, let's see, online. I mean, obviously, like I watch, I watch tutorials, like it's going out of style. James Gurney has, has tutorials going on. Other people have really cool drawing demos online. Um, so I do just kind of like watch those every day when I'm just working. I'll just throw it on and just kind of look up. Uh, Jake Parker's doing a lot of them. Um, so just seeing like whatever other people's processes are. Um, as far as books go, uh, I can't remember the name of it. Um, but Ben Caldwell has like an old book from like probably decades old now, but it's like character, dynamic character design or something like that. Um, he did a really great job putting that book together. Hey, we're done. Okay. Then because of the time, you guys want to hang out and just put a little bit more time into this thing, get it rendered? Not fully rendered, but just like a quick and dirty. Or do you guys have to go? Because I can stop it right now. Well, I'm going to keep going. You guys can bail on me if you want to. Oh, Sid Mead's awesome. It's kind of untouchable, though. Like, <laughs> like there's, like, certain re reference that I look at, and I'm just like, well, someday I'll be able to do that. And then there's other reference that I look at to teach me how to do things. So, like, I think I'm always looking for something that's just above what I'm able to do. Um, I really like the Bridgman books, and... They're, but they're very confusing. Um, they don't really teach you how anatomy works, but he does have like a really strong sense of just like rhythms. So I always really like those. All right, so. Sorry if I'm going quiet on you guys again. Thanks for hanging out. If anybody's peeling off, really appreciate you guys coming out. This isn't going to go on for too much longer, but I'm going to see if I can get a few details on it.
you're welcome. Someone hit me with a question that if I if I missed one, repeat it. I'm just gonna be flatting these teeth per second here, so it might take me a second. So I can yap at least while I'm flatting the teeth. There's just a lot of them. Or if nobody wants to listen to me talk anymore, that makes sense to me too. tips on value control um, it kind of goes down to the rhythm thing again like you uh, you know like you're you're trying to draw the eye with value like a lot of people like the last thing you want to do is draw people's eyes with color um, and again this goes back to my original statement at the beginning of the stream like once you know the rule you can break it however you want so don't it's not like a steadfast rule but value is going to drive your eye so the bright shapes you know that's why I chose bright for the uh, the teeth I just want them to feel very important I could have gone just as dark you know like make them like onyx and black and I would have had the same kind of read because the body is sort of like a middle gray it would, but it would have had a different effect uh, but you want to drive people to what you want them to look like look at and value is a big way to do that so if you want something to kind of like um, sort of like merge together then you just want to use like very very similar values and you want that stuff to kind of like fall away and that way you can save your kind of like your really important moments to have like the very high contrast brighter stuff so you can see like um and i am right now i'm leaving the value a little bit muted um because i want to add highlights to it and so you have to have somewhere to go you can't put highlights on white otherwise i would make the teeth white um but i do want the sort of like prominent form of this character to be the teeth like those are sort of like the most interesting thing and then so you just it's it's just kind of like the psychology of it right it's like what do you want your viewer to be looking at that's what you want to spend your kind of like most contrasted element of your value set on all right i'm going to keep the the veins on a separate layer so okay so I like to add a little bit of plaque at the bottom of the teeth. So it just like grounds them a little bit, makes them look a little nastier. And then even on the tips, I always think of like candy corns, you can just like have like just a, tit, a tiny bit brighter on the tips. like old dog teeth it's got that vibe going on all right and then underneath that layer now i can go back in with a darker value and really ground them on some of this like carapace stuff and i'm just kind of like making it a little bit messy because i want it to feel splotchy and then i'll go back in and add some more deliberate stuff so get some spotting in there this is like where I, I look at like animal patterns a lot So now let's 
get some lighting going on. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do what I've been doing with some of my pieces online where I'm gonna backlight it and then I'll go back in and kind of put like a little bit of an ambient front light. So I'm gonna set this layer to add. You can set it to glow, you can set it to overlay, whatever you like. And then just start finding that top edge where the light is kind of creeping. You can see like having that the value of the the spikes and the teeth. Now I have a place to go with like the the white of this. You can see it's just sort of popping ever so slightly. If you have no, if it's if the teeth and the claws and everything were already white, then you would have a really tough time popping up that highlight. It's a big rule for like eyeballs because everybody always makes eyeballs white. Then you can't put a highlight on them. Any tips on unique ways to call the muse of yourself and summon some inspiration? Um, I I really play a lot of games with myself as far as like you know like ways to kind of get that inspiration going. Um, you know, like when I go to the supermarket, I'm looking for people doing hilarious things. I've got a dark, I have a dark sense of humor with that stuff, I guess. But you know, if I see someone just doing something really random and bizarre, but it's really funny to me, like that just starts a story. I start trying to think of ways that I can like kind of represent that. Um, kind of like style, you know. It's like these are these are experiences that no one else is going to have, so you have this opportunity to tell someone a story of something that happened to you at Target or Walmart or something like that that's really funny to you. Uh, it doesn't have to be literal, but it can just be kind of like you're just trying to get the feeling across, you know. And I, I, I feel like those are these moments that can really bring a lot of life to your work because they're your experiences. And so like as long as you're still feeling how that felt to see that thing that amused you or made you sad or whatever, if that if that's coming across in your work then you're just you're doing yourself a really good service of um, of teaching yourself how to tell stories with characters and, and bring stories to life so I I really really heavily rely on just going out finding things seeing something funny that one of my kids did or I, I find this stuff is really really important um, I don't really like to reflect on my own personal stuff anymore. I like interpreting outside world stuff as much as possible. I think that's it's just a game, you know, it's just a fun game. So what I, what I do with these highlights is I, I kind of block them in. They're not very interesting right now. I mean, they start to see, they, they start to add volume to the form, which is nice. Um, but then we'll go back and just chisel away at them a little bit. And that really starts to make them look a little bit more believable. So it's, it's not just a one and done kind of thing. It's a bit of a process. That's just kind of another little fun thing. So now that kind of gets that rolling and then you go back and add little details and you know scratch the surfaces away a little bit where the light isn't leaking through. And on the shoulder we can put a little 
start adding in some of the skin texture back in. I was already starting to do it up here, but I like to do it after the fact. Just makes these edges a lot more interesting when they have more specific details. started going over my hour but whatever whatever uh, no I'm not using Photoshop um, this is clip studio but you could almost do everything identically in Photoshop there as far as like overall painting styles like they work almost identically I just have it in that like clip studio because of a few things that it little tools that it has but not I don't think one's better than the other I use Photoshop for most of my color work honestly I still like that better but I'll do all the drawing in the clip I think it's mainly that I've just set up a lot of my brushes I like in clip. I have not migrated either both of my painting brushes and my clips brushes to in the same place, so I just go back and forth. And the nice thing about clip is you can go to Photoshop and Photoshop to clip and back and forth, no big deal. Alright, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a duplicate of all my flats. And I'm going to merge them into one layer, so it's going to look like garbage for a second. And I'm going to set that to add. It's going to blow it all out. And then I'm going to drop the opacity down. And then I'm going to put a mask on that and turn it off, basically. Now I'm just going to start slowly adding in some sort of kick lights. Kind of sloppy about this first. So you can see, like, just kind of adding some volume into the fronts here, and then go back and carve into it. And it's just kind of like a push and pull thing where you kind of add and subtract and add and subtract and Add layer. The add layer is like um. How do I describe this? You feel me? It, so overlay. When you use an overlay layer, it takes everything that's a value higher than fifty percent, and it starts to incrementally brighten the form, or brighten whatever's underneath it, based on the value of that color. So if you had pure white, it would it would really brighten it up a lot, and if you had like a darker color, but still above 50%, then it wouldn't lighten it as much. But then anything below 50% in the overlay layer is gonna to start to darken the forms. So a lot of people like to do these kinds of processes with the overlay layer. Um, so what that does though, is it does truncate it to 128 values on either end of the 50% mark, right? So you're only getting half of the scale. Um, add, everything's brighter. So black is, it's not showing up at all, but as soon as you go one value above black, it starts to lighten the form and it just keeps going up all the way to white. And it will get to white. So I just use it because I am doing highlights and I don't I'm not trying to darken anything. 
Um, so I, I prefer to have all 256 values working for me for my, um, my highlight scales versus um, limiting myself to just 128. All right, so, and a lot of times what I, like I, I like to work really bright and do things like over the top like this, and then I'll, I'll dim it down with the opacity. So I just get like a subtle base and then now I can go back in and just get my little shiny highlights in. kind of like stip on these in. And this is usually where I'll just kind of like throw on some good music and just kind of spend some time just relaxing inside of because even though I'm kind of cranking through it tonight this is like a really fun kind of relaxing Of the process where you're just kind of like turning forms and getting them to read as different kinds of shiny materials and flat materials. I don't know, I think, I think the exploration of it is really fun. Can you work on an ad layer with more than just white? Like, can you use muted yellow? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yep, that's exactly what you should do. Use it for a lot of, uh, it works really, really well for like glow effects. If you want something to have like, uh, you know, like a, like a headlight or something like that, then you just, and you get some really interesting results like if you have like let's say you had like a purple light that you wanted to blow out and have it look like it was illuminated which I do a lot in like my robot eyes and things like that um, but then instead of using purple to lighten it up and that you use like a orange or a green or something like that and you get some really interesting cross effects and it can look really so, sort of neat a little bit more sophisticated than a color you maybe would have chosen for yourself shadow into the sky. And then, sort of last but not least, um, I'm going to put a layer above my line work and just sort of start lightening it up a little bit where there's some highlights so that it's not quite so abrupt. So it just drops it into the light source back there. I 
It's like an old Disney trick. Sleeping Beauty era. They colored the line work. I think I'm gonna just make a few adjustments. I feel like his carapace needs to be just a little darker, so. Just throw the multiply layer in and just I'm just gonna like very cheaply darken this thing. Yeah, that's maybe a little dark, but taking those values to kinda pop away from each other a little bit. the kinds of things that like when you're just working on your own nobody sees you making these like last minute changes it just seems like you got it right the first time but very rarely do I get it right the first time but already just by pumping that value I think he just reads a little bit better and then take these highlights down oh, wrong one this one nope little highlight on this eye to kind of make it come alive. Yeah, I think that's it. I think that, oh wait, you know what? Let's do some spit. Appropriately gross. All right. All right. So that's going to be it for tonight. Um, and then tomorrow night, I think I'm going to do the mech on the same silhouette. So that one's going to take longer. Hope you guys are willing to put up with me. But just drawing mechanical stuff just takes longer. But I think it'll be. Uh, fun to do the demon, which is obviously like a bit more organic, and then have it contrast with like how you can use the same silhouette for like uh, like the mech or stuff like that. But if anybody has any questions or want to talk about anything, I'm willing to hang out. But I am going to call it on the demo. And have some tea. Glad you guys liked it. Thank you so much for hanging out. Hopefully that was Yeah, like I like I had to apologize about the style thing, but that is definitely like um that's like my soapbox. It's like people have been struggling to find style and, and how they feel about their own style for as long as this stuff has been going on and it's unfortunately much simpler and more complicated than everybody wants. What type of tea am I drinking? Just Tetley tea, like the cheap stuff from the supermarket. Should probably start drinking better tea I can afford to. Oh, I'm gonna darken the head a little bit more too. Cool. 
All right, well, I got, uh, it says 12.25 in the morning for me, so I got, let's say, five more minutes. Anybody have any questions before I, I bail? Otherwise, we can hang out tomorrow night. Well then, until tomorrow night, hopefully you guys will come out. I will see you then, and it take me a few minutes, but I will uh, post this up so it becomes permanent on the YouTube channel. And any final thoughts on line weights? Final thoughts. It's like an ongoing discussion. It's like the most important thing to me as far as I'm concerned. It's like the way a form turns using line. I'm a huge Alphonse Mucha nut. I think his line weight is, if you look at his drawings, his ability to make forms turn with thicks and thins, or like a really good graffiti artist. Oh my god. And if you, if you really want a form to look like it has a light side and a dark side using line weight, like it actually has volume and weight, and actually rises to like a lighter shape you have to get your line weight to be distributed where it's thin as it breaks and is hitting that highlight and thick as it compresses and gets dark and heavy and it it almost becomes like a kind of like a mechanical way of expressing how you feel about a form hitting the ground that you just lay in that heavy line and as it rises up into the light mass you're kind of like ghosting off your hand so it's uh I think it's really important to practice your line weight if you're going to design characters with a line. It's the thing that is the most um, important is really understanding like how to use it. And plants are a great test in drawing that stuff. They're excellent because they're just really sinewy and beautiful. Uh, anything you do to prep yourself for a work day? Uh, yep, um, lots of coffee. Uh, I get on Pinterest. Pinterest has algorithms, which is like looking at the last few things that you're looking at, and I just try and like absorb information. I try not to look at other concept art, even though like I get totally sucked in because I'm a fanboy of other people's concept work. Um, but I try and look at things that are just interesting and beautiful, um, things that are kind of like inspiring, things that I don't know how to draw, and. Um, and then on, if I'm being good to myself, which is not always every day because deadlines are deadlines, um, I give myself one hour every morning in the just to draw for myself whatever I want to draw and just draw. And that's most of the stuff that I post on Instagram, but if it's a complete failure, you'll never see it. But that doesn't matter. It's like that's my time where I'm just drawing and exploring and kind of getting loose. And then it's, it's twofold. One, it's loosening up my hands, getting the rust off. And the other thing is um, if I do a whole day's work for someone else and then I leave my most tired time for myself at the end of the night, I do like to work at night, but if I'm, then I, then I, I think you start to harbor some resent for the work day. Um, and then on the flip side, if you give yourself an hour or whatever you think is reasonable and you draw for yourself and then you do someone else's work, you feel like you've paid yourself first. I don't know, there's a psych psychological boost and then it just seems like even the work you're doing for your clients is so much better because you just feel better about yourself. And so I think that's a big part of my day is just trying to get myself into that right mindset. And that's kind of my my way of kind of getting my, my work day started. Uh, how long have I been making characters? Uh, 25 years. I'm 45 now. And I started when I was 22, so 23 years is really when I started designing characters for um, studios and things like that. Uh, I'm not counting like college and high school and all that stuff. Uh, have a good night, Tad. Okay, any other questions? When it comes to approaching character design, is it good to keep track of your process, like keeping catalogs of references, your sketch layers, etc., like for your portfolio? Huh. 
an interesting question. Uh, it can't hurt. It's not important. Um, I think it's. Im I think it's important to keep track of the things that you want to express in your portfolio, and by that I mean like if your development process, meaning like what sketches you used, what or let's say thumbnails to sketches to roughs to preliminary drawings. I'm just adding stages in, but whatever stages it takes you to get to a final design. Um, if that's what you're being hired for, because your portfolio is literally like the job is, hey, we're going to design a bunch of these characters and it's going to be a process. You know, I, I want to see how you think. Then I think that that's really advantageous in a portfolio. But that's not all portfolios. Like, a, a portfolios are sort of ta tailored to the job that you're kind of applying yourself to. Um, so, if if you're established, like you've you know you have a bit more um, experience under your belt, they may not care as about it, as much about your process as when you're starting out because they know that you can execute, you can bring things to fruition. Um, but when you're starting out. Um, a piece of advice that I like to give people who are putting portfolios together is think about like what they're actually hiring you to do. They're hiring you to design characters, but if the director or the art director comes to you, they, they basically don't want to deal with you. And I'm just going to say this like as plainly as possible. When they're looking at your portfolio, they're looking to see if from stage to stage to stage until you arrive at your final, if you think the same way that they think, meaning you have six thumbnails and you pick number three and then you drive number three into a few different uh, rough stages and then you take the first one of that and you bring that up to a tighter sketch and then um, you make maybe two tight sketches and you choose the one with the cape or something like that and you bring that to final. Well, if the art director or the director looks at that and sees that every single stage you are making choices that they either would have made themselves or they appreciate on some level, um, then they're going to have a, a, an amount of trust that they can basically just say, hey, we're designing this character with a cape and we need you on it. And they're not going to have to sit over your shoulder and tell you every single time in this next step, like what's working, what's not working. They're going to be able to let you go. And that is making their life easier. That's why you're going to get hired. So early on, a portfolio should really just demonstrate your thought process. And if that means keeping track of your rough drawings or things like that, to show why you were making certain decisions, then I think that could be a huge advantage. Um, I think anybody can approach that question the same, a different way, but really just the goal is, hey, I wanna show you how I think. And if you like the way I think, we're gonna have an amazing relationship. You know, like you're gonna be able to make your movie. I'm gonna be able to, you know, sit over here and draw the things I like to draw. And we're gonna just gonna be really uh, working well together. But if, you know, God forbid you have a mismatch and someone's like, I would not have chosen that one as the one I would brought to fruition. Well, that's a really good for you as well because you're not going to sit in a seat every day and have someone saying like, ah, not like that, like this, not like this, like that. That can be a really frustrating position to be in. So um, I think that is a very long answer then. It can't hurt, especially starting out to, to kind of like show your thought process and keep track of that stuff. All right, one more question. Can you give three short tips and advice about doing character design? Okay, three short tips about doing character design. Um, develop a story. Tell yourself that is both entertaining to you, um, you know, that is inspiring to you or makes you sad or whatever, like latch on to an emotion that you want the character to emote um, to give off so if you want something to be goofy if you want something to be scary if you want something to be emo if you want something to, whatever the emo the just sort of the general vibe start really fostering that and as you're working on the piece it, you want you want to feel that emotion from that character like you want as you're looking at it you want to continually feel that that is the vibe the sort of feeling the emotion that you were trying to get as soon as 
you lose that emotion no matter how good or bad the drawing is. Um, the character is not meeting the brief anymore. So I really do like, you know, like I like to draw a lot of goofy, scary things. I like the mashup of that, but like, like that's the space that I like to live in a lot of times. And some, there's times where I'm like, oh, I want to draw a really heroic robot like that. Okay. So that's, that's the, that's the feeling I'm going to live in. And, and you can't let that go. You have to draw with that feeling the entire time. So that would be tip number one. Um, tip number two, um, would be, um, clear clear forms right like you want to make sure that your um, that it's easy for everyone who's looking at it to understand how the thing moves and um, as soon as things start to get cluttered and cross things over and you know like and you start to have really un, um, unclear forms in your design then people are going to ask for breakdowns or they're going to understand not understand how something works or um, I think I, that's why I, le I lean heavily towards functionality like how something actually moves and trying it doesn't actually have to work it just has you have to believe that it would work and so I think striking a really strong sense of believability which is not the same as realistic but if you can make someone believe that something functions then I think that you're going to be in good shape. And then, I mean, there's endless amounts of character design things, but I think maybe one other one, um, I think picking what your focus element is going to be like for all intents and purposes, like what the gag is, right? Like what, like I was using teeth, like mouths, like in really strange, ways of this character like um, as soon as I started decided on how I was going to do that shoulder um, that was sort of the gag and I wanted to support that and so everything in the the design here had to kind of support the gag of and, and gag is only really applicable like it's a nice word to use for something that's funny you wouldn't really want to use a gag on a more serious design as far as terminology goes but you get what I'm saying like what is the hook that is you're trying to support and always look to make sure that that one the thing that set makes that character really special is being supported by all the other forms um, as soon as it becomes oh this random horse head is stuck on this guy's body and he has ugg boots on and uh, uh, an oven mitt um, it might be funny but I, I don't think I get quite what the focus is but if you know like if the oven mitt has like country patterns on it and the boots are covered with mud and hay and you know whatever all of a sudden they start to support this horse head thing um, so I think it's really it's really about finding that cohesion that said a really funny wacky character design could be something that's just like all over the place but I think you have to be intentional about that. That has to be that. Now that's your hook. That it's all over the place. Does that make sense? Just support your idea with that. You know, make sure the the thing that you're trying to say is supported by all of the the sort of like forms that maybe aren't the primary forms. All right. That's gonna be my last question for the night. But if you guys have any other questions, same time tomorrow night, I'm gonna do another drawing. It's definitely going to take me longer because it's going to be a mech, so there'll be plenty of time for more questions. Um, but I hope you guys will come out for it, and it should be fun. Thank you very much, guys, and I will see you tomorrow night. Have a fun time. Good. I'm glad it was helpful. All right. See you guys tomorrow night.